OK, so the Higgs field is like any other field. It exists everywhere. On average, it could be 0 or it could be not 0. And I'm going to convince you now that you actually care. <laughs> and you know how I'm going to do it? I'm going to do this using the hair on your head. Okay? We are going to use your hair as a field detector. Okay? And we've already learned that we can do that. right? We can use your hair to detect a wind field. We can use your hair to detect an electric field. And we're going to use your hair to detect a Higgs field too. Okay? Now, if the wind field in this room, well, I can sort of look around. And everyone's hair looks, well, almost everybody's hair looks pretty good. And that tells us that the wind in this room is basically, on average, zero. And if it weren't, uh, if we had a big breeze blowing through here, it would be a very different story. Now, on the other hand, as, as we, we said earlier, if you turned on a strong electric field, uh, it would be a very bad hair day for everybody. OK. Now, what about the Higgs field? And when I look around and I look at your hair, I know that the Higgs field in this room is not zero. It's, it's, it's decent size. It's not huge, but it's not zero. Because if instead you woke up one day and discovered that the Higgs field were zero, it would be a very, very bad day. Okay? Um, your hair would explode as well, along with the rest of you. <laughs> okay. It would be bad. And the reason is that the, reason is that the, the Higgs field um, is responsible for some of this picture. What I did when I drew this picture is I drew all of the heavy fields at the top and the light fields at the bottom. The top quark is very heavy, the electrons very light. If instead the Higgs field on average were zero, most of these particles would be massless or very light. And uh, particularly the electron would be massless. And the weak interactions would no longer be weak. The weak nuclear interaction would now be a pretty strong interaction. And this would totally change our world. In particular, atoms would just completely fall apart. And atomic nuclei would also completely fall apart. So there'd be no Earth. There'd be no stars. And I hesitate to say it, <laughs> but there would be no secret science club. <laughs> so you care. All right? It really matters that the Higgs field is not zero. <laughs> but as I emphasized, important as this thing is, we know almost nothing about it. And the point is, we do know this, that because it's a field, it has waves and particles. And if we want to get a handle on what this field is, or fields are, we are going to have to learn about it by producing the Higgs particle. We want to find the Higgs particle, or several if there are several Higgs fields, and start to learn about the Higgs field through the Higgs particle. And how do we do that? Well, I've already mentioned that most particles, including the Higgs particle, can decay. Where are we headed? I'm going to try to explain to you how we look for the Higgs particle and how we find it. But to do that, I want to give you a feel for how we would look for any particle. So for example, um, a Z particle. Now, if you have a wave, as we've seen, it can dissipate. In this case, I had it waves in a piece of metal that were dissipating into sound waves. Well, particles can dissipate in a similar way. They decay into particles of other types. For example, the Z particle can just spontaneously disappear and turn into a muon and an anti-muon. It's antiparticle. Or it can turn into an up quark and an anti-up quark. It's got actually lots of different possibilities available to it. So here's a Z particle coming in, and it just, just disappears into a muon and an antimuon. That's just something that nature does. Okay? It's dissipation at the quantum level. Now, what's cool, though, is that you can take one of these processes and turn it around. So we could take an up quark, an anti-up quark, and run it in reverse and create a Z particle through their collision. Now, remember, we have up quarks and up anti-quarks in our protons. So we can take two protons and smash them into each other put these two things together and make the universe ring in the key of Z. We're going to take an up quark and an anti-up quark, smash them together, create a Z particle. The Z will hang around for a while, a trillionth of a trillionth of a second or so, and then turn into, let's say, a muon and an anti-muon. Okay? That's taking motion energy from the up quarks, turning it into mass energy of the Z particle, and then turning it back into motion energy of the muons. Now, this is not a joke, folks. This stuff really happens. Here is, um, remember the Atlas detector? 
Here is a collision that occurred on May 10th, 2010. There were many of these during the past year. This was the first one that they observed in which a Z particle was created right here. Um, proton came in this way, another proton came in that way. They collided. You can see some yellow junk there. That's just the debris from the proton-proton collision. But there are two particles, one of them a muon going this way, which was detected here, here, and here. That's a little hard to see. But, uh, and then the other was an anti-muon, which is detected here, here, and here. This was a Z particle decaying into a muon and anti-muon. Now wait, you might say. I see a muon, I see an anti-muon. How do you know that's a Z particle? And that's a good question. Because in fact, there are other ways to make a muon and an anti-muon at the same time. You can just kind of make them directly out of an up quark and an anti-up quark without ever seeing a Z particle. So how do we know it's a Z particle? Well, this is a bit of a detective story. 